it was a beautiful day. And everyone, I'm sure, before me will have, and after me will, will attest. And there's a reason why it was a beautiful day. It's statistically about the most beautiful day of the year. It's the right temperature, right clarity. The, the hijackers, terrorists knew that. Uh, the same way that the people who plan the New York Marathon know that it's a dry day that generally tends to be of a moderate temperature. That's why they picked the first Sunday in November as the day for the marathon. You don't want the runners getting rained on. You don't want to have freezing cold weather and bad conditions. And that's why, what a coincidence, it tends to be really pretty on that day. So 9-11 they picked because it's always a beautiful time in New York, the, uh, the end of the summer. And I went to the hospital because <coughs> I was teaching a course about mechanical hearts. And the group that I was teaching to um, were a bunch of physicians and nurses, but the company that made the mechanical heart was based on the West Coast. And it was interesting to me because the guy who was sort of in charge of this whole project left that morning because his family was having an event and he wanted to get home to them. So he'd, he'd flown out that morning. Um, and I, I just heard that as I went and I remember giving the lecture to the uh, it's a conference room with maybe 50 people in it. So I'm lecturing these doctors, nurses, technicians about this mechanical part program that they're going to have in their hospital, even though the guy who was in charge of it had left to go back to his family. And then I went back to the operating room. So now it's, uh, you know, it's still early in the mornings before nine o'clock. But my case, I'm doing an aortic valve operation where a person who has very tight aortic stenosis, a blockage of a major valve coming out of the heart needs to be replaced. So I went down, talked to him about what was about to happen, uh, signed the consent, and then he went to sleep. And as he went to sleep, um, I, uh, I went back over to the lecture hall and there's at Columbia Presbyterian where I practice, New York Presbyterian, there's a, a bridgeway that goes between the medical school building and the hospital building. So I crossed back across that bridge and I remember looking downtown because I had a bird's eye view of it and I noticed there was smoke from the, I couldn't tell what it was from, but it's like someone had lit a big match on fire. And when I got into the lecture room, someone said that a, a, a pilot had somehow by mistake and crashed into the World Trade Center. It was probably a small jet uh, or private plane, a propeller plane that someone had not, not well piloted and crashed into the World Trade Center, which was a horrible tragedy. And uh, so I, uh, I you know, lamented that, went back to the operating room. And when I got into the operating room, to start doing the actual case. So I'd taken, I'd opened up his bone. One of my uh, assistants, the perfusionist, the person who runs the heart lung machine said, uh, there's been a second plane that's hit the World Trade Center. And I remembered that, I mean, again, I'm looking at the heart pounding like a python trained inside this you know, man's chest, like coiling back and forth, desperately trying to get out, sick, ill because of this valve that's stuck so they can't pump the blood out to the body. And I got goosebumps, not from that, but from the thought that there was a second plane. So obviously it wasn't an accident. And I told the perfusionist, he was to, to, to block out all information. There was to be no more discussion in the room at all about what happened. Because I could not have the anesthesiologist and the nurses and me distracted by what was happening outside the world. There's only one life I could save, only one life I could lose. And that was the, the guy whose chest it was open in front of me, the man who I'd just spoken to, half hour earlier and put to sleep. So uh, I did the operation, no idea what had happened. And by the time I came out of the OR, the world had changed. The elective schedule was completely terminated. Everyone we could in the hospital, we had to move out. We, we expected thousands of victims from the World Trade Center to be ambulanced up. Anesthesiologists from my hospital started uh, driving downtown. One of them, I remember, Marquis uh, actually rode his bike downtown because he couldn't get through with a car and he wanted to go help. That's what we're, our initial instinct was we were going to go help these people. They were probably burn victims and people who are traumatized from falling and uh, maybe got hurt by the falling rumble. It, 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 it was a all hands on deck. No one's going home. We're going to take care of these folks. And I don't think we got anybody. Not one single person but was brought up town to us from World Trade Center because th there were no survivors. And that's an un unfortunate but paralyzing reality when you're desperately trying to help and you can't. And to put it all in perspective, I was sort of sitting in my, in my office waiting for the victims to come. And I got a call that the man who had left 
the LVAD, the mechanical heart training, the man who was in charge of the project, he was on one of the planes. And remember, they hijacked planes headed to the West Coast because they wanted to get planes that were full of, of uh, fuel so they could explode bigger, bigger bombs. And he actually was one of the people who rushed the cap, the cockpit uh, and of the, of the plane that was going to hit the Pentagon. Remember, the ones from Boston hit New York, the planes from New York were going to Washington. They were hijacking them to go to Washington. It made, it made an arc that way. He, they didn't come back to their own city. And uh, he rushed the cabin. And there's a rumor I've never heard. I heard it was in, in several articles, but I never actually saw the transcript that he had called his or texted or because he uh, somehow communicated with his wife because the plane was low enough, uh, but she wasn't there. So she left a message saying that he was in trouble and he loved her and take care of the kids. And then he rushed the cockpit. Um, they apparently got through or we don't know what happened. You know, there's a lot of rumors about what the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. But that plane never hit the Pentagon. And he and others were credited as heroes for stopping that. And they, just to put two buttons on this, I'll, uh, there's two moments I'll never forget in my life. The first was driving home that night because after it was evident there was no one coming uptown, we were told to get out of the city because we expected more problems. And there was a terrorist threat on the bridge, George Washington Bridge, that I go, I literally ride my bike across the bridge to go, go home. I couldn't go across the bridge. And, I sat there with thousands of New Yorkers crowded in the end, at the, trying to get out of Manhattan. And normally, you know, New Yorkers, we're a pretty rambunctious group, right? Make a lot of noise, yell and scream at each other. Shelly, it was completely silent. As though someone had taken the audio track and thrown it away and just had the video part of it. And all of us just literally sitting, waiting in line, realizing there's nothing we could do, shell-shocked, not understanding what had happened, what it meant, what was gonna change, but we knew that the world was never be the same. When I got home, of course, my wife and the kids were all very small, uh, were very emotional because our apartment was on the Hudson River with a panoramic view of the World Trade Center. So they, the kids saw the World Trade Center go, attacked. They saw that it collapse. These are visions that you can't unforget when you see them. And our house was in a plume of smoke uh, that had wind shifted and brought the brought it a little bit to the west where we live in New Jersey. Well, I'm on the river again, so I'm a mile from two miles from World Trade Center, maybe, and uh, from from Manhattan. And it, it, we were clouded in that, so I could smell the ashes of the buildings that had come down. And I'll uh, the last point that I'll make because I, I this has happened to many people over and over again. The next day, I went in to talk to the patient whose life I was responsible for when the World Trade Center was attacked. And I had to tell him what had happened. And obviously I had to tell him about his own heart, but I had also tell him that while he went to, he went, he was anesthetized, he went to sleep in a different world than he woke up in. And I remember looking at him in trying to you know, explain this, realizing he just couldn't process this. Nobody, nobody could go to sleep and wake up in a world that had changed as much as his had changed. And just because we were awake during it doesn't mean that that didn't hurt us anymore. It was a nightmare that you happened to be awake during. So that's my 9-11 story. How old were your kids? Daphne was uh, 14, uh, 15. And Arab, uh, so the oldest one was 15. Daphne's the chef, you know. Um, it's on my show a lot. Uh, Arabella uh, was born in 1990. So she was, uh, she, well, she was 10 because she was born at the end of the year. And Zoe was six. So, you know, 14, 10, 6, basically. The, and the, the youngest one, Oliver, was uh, a year and a half old. And he was the one that Lisa held, not knowing whether to run or not, when she saw the attacks. Because remember, we didn't realize that it was going to be limited to the World Trade Center. We, didn't, we also didn't realize how devastating those attacks would be. But we fully anticipated there would be more terrorist attacks happening throughout Manhattan. Um, you know, and, and, you know, nuclear alternatives. I mean, there were bad things that were in our, you could imagine you can, the worst you can imagine had already happened. So you have to start imagining worse. How did your older children handle all that? Well, there's a naivete when you're that age. You think anything is happening must have happened before because you're so young. They didn't realize that it would be the moment that would define their lives. And they were only toddlers or sibling, you know, children, infants. Um, but it did define their lives. And there, because of that naivete, I don't think it fully hit them. They knew it was a catastrophe. They could tell from the way Lisa and I reacted and everyone around them. 
And of course, we were getting continuous calls from other parts of the country, people not knowing if we were, because we're right, you know, we're so close to it. They didn't know if we were involved, what, what, what we were seeing. So they started off, are you okay to tell us, is it real? Is this really occurring? I mean, it, it can't be as bad as the media is making it seem, but it was. You're a doctor. At what point did you start realizing the health effects of working, living, going to school in that toxic environment? Well, when I got home, um, it was still a bucolic day and you could see the World Trade Center plumes going up. So I didn't process it then. But by the next day, we had the fumes all over our house. And that's, I did think at that time that people are going to have respiratory issues. I wasn't thinking about more severe problems, but I was thinking asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are going to, people are going to have problems with this, with this air. Uh, it does make sense to me that there were other chronic illnesses that were unmasked by these toxic fumes being inhaled for days by people who are trying to help and people who are just living in the area. The emotional impact, there's no way you could pretend it wasn't going to be there. It was Verdun. It was my lie. It was every catastrophic battle that you can think about in human history rolled into one little environment. You know, it was like the Dresden fire bombings, but in the you know, middle of New York. And so people, there's, our minds are not, not evolved to, to cope with those kinds of catastrophes. We're used to the smaller catastrophes. Someone you love dies, a terrible car accident. I mean, even those are scarring, but you don't think about your, your world being attacked, which is what happened. And how do you think that either prepared us or didn't for our current pandemic? I don't think it prepared us. It's very different. You had a named enemy. You could focus your anger on that. It unified us because um, that's what people do when they have an opponent they can see. The virus did the opposite because we began to blame each other because we began to see each other as the enemy since we actually carried the virus. And I think that's one big lesson that will come out of this whole experience is the people who grew up, who came of age with 9-11 saw a nation respond very differently. And we're good enough to respond that way. We don't have to respond the way we're responding now. Okay, I thank you, Dr. Oz. Stay safe, stay well.